Okay, so my name is Brett Cannon. Uh, I've been a core developer for 20 years as of this past Tuesday, literally, was my first commit at, with my commit bit rights. Uh, I have been attending PyCon also just as long. I actually got my first, I got my commit rights one week after the first PyCon. Uh, I am the dev manager for generally the Python experience of VS Code. Uh, PyLance and Jupyter are separate teams, but otherwise everything else falls under me. And uh, Luciana, who's well, my PM and other people on the team, um, what else? What else can I say? I'm on the steering council. It's my fifth and final year. Uh, I decided to step down to make sure there's an empty seat for the next election, which will be this November. Uh, just to make sure there's some turnover. And when we're doing stuff, I said five years seems like a good amount of time. So I'm going to stick to my word and step down. Uh, I don't know. Stuff. Uh, bachelor's in philosophy, PhD in computer science. Um, own a cat with my wife Andrea, who, as everyone said, she actually owns. Um, yeah, I think it's enough random rambling about me. Uh, who wants to ask me a question? Sure, sure. That's the yes. Uh, roadmaps. Can you tell us uh, the near future plans for? Especially, I'm interested in for VS Code and any kind of integration with AI or like type of natural language directives or to generate code, anything like that? Okay, so the question was general roadmaps around VS Code and specifically AI, AI do you, and do you want Python as well or just the AI bit? Just the AI part. Just the AI part, okay. So we actually just in the last release, if I remember correctly, uh, announced that in our insiders we've actually added uh, chat support via the GitHub Copilot extension. So there's now a keyboard shortcut, is it control I? I can't remember the command. Uh, read the release notes. Um, and there's actually a blog post now. But basically we've now added direct inline um, AI chat support so you can actually have it right where the code is and ask little questions. We also have shortcut support to kind of let you say like, hey, I want help answering this question based on commands in VS Code, for instance. Uh, there's also a chat window on the side. We have plans for other integrations. Um, they're all at various stages. Um, I mean, just if you basically think about probably wherever there's a time where you have to make a decision as a human being, you might want like that little help to get started. We'll probably put something in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're trying to be very thoughtful about this, and the, I think that long term, the long term expectation I think is we're not going to make it Copilot specific. To be clear, like VS Code is obviously very uh, API driven, and we want to keep that even with the AI stuff. Obviously, we hope you all become Copilot uh, subscribers. Helps keep uh, keep our jobs. Uh, but um, we are trying to put it in places and to be thoughtful about it. We're not just throwing AI at the wall and seeing what sticks. Uh, we did a hackathon at the beginning of January, for instance, to try to test a bunch of this stuff out. So we're trying to do it in the most thoughtful way possible while continuing with our ethos of open and accessible and all that stuff. Did that, did that answer the question? Is it a follow-up or is it a follow -up. Uh, Yeah, sure. Where do you accept feedback from developers regarding the feature that you just described? So feedback should always just be open as issues on the VS Code repo. Uh, anything, so basically anything that goes into uh, the core VS Code experience is just github.com slash Microsoft slash VS Code. There's actually a command um, for get reporting issues and I believe there's even a feedback button in the bottom right corner in the taskbar. You can just totally use that. It'll, it, put that in, it'll probably, I believe it'll pop up a GitHub issue, and just take what you put in, fill it in, and then you can just submit it. And uh, someone on the general VS Code team will literally read it, probably a dev, and we actually see pretty much every issue unless it's automatically closed because it's found to be a dupe or something. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Anwar. Okay. Um, how do you balance between day job, open source stuff, and personal life? So the question from Inamar was, how do I balance work, open source, and personal life? Uh, my wife, Andrea, is, can totally yell out whatever she wants. So there, there's a couple aspects to this one. So first, uh, when I got hired at Microsoft, it got put into my contract that I get to spend 20% of my time on open source of my choosing. Because it was just assumed it would be Python, so it's beneficial to the company anyway, so they were happy to give that to me. Um, the other part is there's various aspects of my job that just touches open source, because VS Code itself is open source, and we're very big on the open and trying to minimize anything that, that's closed, right? So it's a constant push. For instance, all my WebAssembly work has been 
work open source because we're trying to do more WebAssembly stuff for VS Code.dev. Um, and then, as I said, there's the 20% bit, and then whatever I do outside of that time. And work even is not really like hard on the 20%. They let me bleed a bit as necessary and all that. Um, and then after that, with balancing with personal life, the, <laughs> you can't hear that slight huh from my wife. Um, <laughs> That's, that's taken practice and it's taken years of evaluating when open source worked out well for me and made me happier and when open source made me not happy. Uh, the general rule in our house actually is no code past 9 p.m. Um, I don't sleep well, honestly. Um, but also to kind of keep under control the amount of things I do that require me to interact with the public because honestly the biggest stress in open source, for those who don't know, is interacting with the public when the public is not kind back, right? It's those people who don't necessarily mean malice, but just don't quite communicate that well, and it comes off as malice, right? It's like, don't do that, you shouldn't do that, right? Like all the negatives, right, get thrown at you, and especially when you're ex as exposed as I can get online, you can get it really negatively or get a lot of little negatives that all add up to feel like a big negative. So I try to minimize that in the evenings. Uh, also, one, one day every weekend, I don't touch anything that's publicly accessible in that regard. I can still code, Andrew will still let me code, and I will say she lets me, because um, she helps me, keeps me in check and honest to all this. Uh, one day, I don't touch anything, like coding's fine, but like issues, outside. I get outside, right. Uh, I can still code, but it's very much a, me doing whatever I want on my laptop, not having to interact with anybody else. And then once a month every year, uh, I completely step away from that. Uh, usually we coincide it with a vacation to make it feel a little less like I am stepping away for a month and then vacation on top of it so I can really unplug on vacation. Um, obviously there's a little weirdness in terms of my work being open source, like, like the VS Code extension is actual open source. So I had to kind of keep it in check that work open source always can still happen during that time off, but it's worked. We've, been, we've had this structure for how many years now? 10? Yeah, I've been doing it roughly this way for a decade, and it's helped a lot and kind of minimized the burnout. So that, that's the general answer. That, that makes sense? And you didn't have to say anything. Uh, next question. I've got a question. Go for it, Nicholas. So your background was originally in philosophy, not computer science? Yes, my background was originally in philosophy, not computer science. So how does your philosophy background inform your computer science work? Okay, so the question is, is how does philosophy inform my computer science work? Um, so the, co if at all. So the cop-out answer is symbolic logic, right? Like, philosophy learns symbolic logic, I mean, it, and it just plays right into it, like understanding how ands and ors work. It's the very simplistic answer that I used to give when I was at parties when I was younger, and they were going, like, oh, what did you get your degree in? Oh, philosophy, well, what the hell are you gonna do with that? Well, I'm going to go to grad school in computer science, like, how the heck did that work? Uh, how are you making that leap? I was like, that's the easy answer. The more complex answer is philosophy, because philosophy is the science of stuff that science can't answer yet, right? It's the weird stuff that you can't scientifically prove, but hopefully maybe someday you can. It still requires a logic and understanding large systems, right? So philosophy is a lot of um, making lots of little conclusions that you can tie together to answer the bigger question, or taking a bigger question, breaking it down logically into smaller questions that, that you could then prove and hopefully answer. And I mean, software is like that, right? Like we write small little functions that we plug together for composability to solve a bigger problem, or we see a bigger problem and we break it down to smaller and smaller functions that we can mentally comprehend, and then we code it up, and then it builds back up to the bigger system. So for me, it's just it's basically just be able to think in terms of those systems, right? It's thinking from the large to the small, from the small, small to the large. And honestly, philosophy is just fun, so that's why I did that. Next question. Yes. Do you get any direction from Microsoft as far as the direction of Python generally? Are they simply here to support Python in whatever direction they've frozen, or do they have specific suggestions for how it can be matured or changed? So the question was, does Microsoft provide any direction to me for where Python should go? And the flat out answer is no. They literally never tell me anything about anything. When it comes to Python, I tell Microsoft about where Python is going, to be kind of blunt. Um, no, there's nothing. It's, no, it's never even come up. No one's asked, hey, can we kind of go this way or can we maybe get this in line? Never happened once. Like random coworkers will message me and they're like, hey, I got this idea or whatever, but like management or any, any suggestion of that, 
no. They've never even suggested it or even hinted at it. It's never even come up in conversation. They're, Microsoft's just here to be supportive. Next question. Oh, yeah. Um, not sure if I've already asked, but uh, can you tell some of the real world applications or projects that Microsoft has worked on based on by? Can I talk about any real-world projects that Microsoft works, has worked on that has used Python? Well, huh? Oh, GitHub Copilot? Yeah, I mean, pretty much anything ML-based is, if, but there's, how is it not gonna use Python? So yeah, Copilot with all its training and all that. Um, what else specifically that we can say? Yeah, I mean, that's the funny thing, right? Like if you think of Python 3.11 or honestly any Python since I've worked at the company, Steve Dower's worked at the company, Eric's worked at the company, the whole free, faster C Python team, right? Like all those projects Microsoft's worked on in some capacity. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's one of those, it's, it's for a lot of companies, right? It's a piece of infrastructure that's used in random places and just all over the place. And we also know customers come asking us to help with their Python stuff. So people ask us, hey, how do I help this customer do this thing on Azure or whatever? Uh, there are some things I know we can't say specifically. Um, you don't know what I'm talking about. That's fine. Uh, sec secret bread knowledge. Yeah, SQL Server support for UDFs and all that. Um, I don't know. Anything else? Yeah, there are backend services uh, at Xbox and stuff that are all running under Python. Um, I don't know if we can specifically which backends. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I know there's some stuff over in Office. Once again, all the AI stuff. Well, Pyrite is written in TypeScript, but that does help with the Python community. So yeah, we do work on that in, in PyLance, obviously. Um, yeah, that's probably the best answer I can give. Um, did you have a follow-up question with that? Yeah, just a follow-up question. So is there a shift that um, people are, like, you know, all the developers, they're moving away from front-end ecosystem to Python? Is there like a shift that, that people are so the question is, do we see a movement internally of people moving away from .NET to, Microsoft, uh, to Python? I wouldn't say so. It's just the new areas within the company, like AI and ML and all that, is obviously bringing a lot of people in. All the data scientists obviously are doing work in Python, right? The general areas of strength that Python holds just happens to be there, and they, but they also have to be very big growth areas in general. And so there's just kind of an innate growth in that direction within the company for Python usage, so I think Go ahead, another question. Yeah, question. If somebody wants to contribute to open source packages or get started in that, how do you how do you suggest people get started with getting their first commit into something that's out there in the Python world and kind of getting focused in that? Way? Sure. Uh, did you want to answer this, James, or you want to be next? Okay. Um, so the question was basically, how do you get into open source to get that first contribution? So it's going to really vary from person to person and project project to project. I was actually asked that this almost exact question walking over, so I'm a little prepped. Um, so it, first of all, it's gonna come down to you, right? The key thing here is to find something you enjoy. Don't do it for the fame. Don't do it for the money. I can tell you there's none of either of it really in it long term. Um, the key thing to do is do it because you want to do it because that's actually gonna be what gets you to come back and to stick with it. Because sometimes this is a bit of a slog and sometimes it's not. But you wanna do it because you enjoy it. After that, it's gonna come down to what that enjoyment happens to be. And for some people it can be going to help out with some project that they use regularly that they just happen to love. It could be wanting to go help on a project that happens to have been abandoned and needs help. Um, it can totally vary. And in all those situations, it's really gonna come down to the project. Like some projects need help with triage on issues. Some just need uh, people to bounce ideas off of. Some people just have open issues that just need PRs. It's, some people need help writing documentation. It's really gonna depend. There's unfortunately no good single answer that I can ever give other than make sure it's something you enjoy because you want to get enjoyment out of all this. You should never do it for some other reason. It's just not worth it otherwise. Like at the language summit, we were talking about all this and we were saying like, you really should be contributing to Python and all, almost for all the core devs, we continue to contribute to Python, not for the tech, but for the people in that room, right? It's for the people, right? Like I, I'm somewhat known for a phrase where I, I, I said once that I came, for the, I came for the language, but I stayed for the community. And that really should be why you participate in open source. It should be for the people that you build the relationships with in the community and those projects and that become friends long term and all that. Like that really should hopefully end up being the long term motivation is why you do this. 
the tech eventually should just become secondary. So hopefully that's where you can derive the enjoyment. James? So you've been contributing to Python for 20 years, and you didn't get into this for the fame or the money. Mm -hmm. But at what point over the last 20 years did you first realize, Python, this thing is kind of a big deal? So Jane's question was, I've been doing this for 20 years. I didn't get into the fame or the money. I will admit I got into it to build, help build an open source portfolio because being a guy with a bachelor's degree in philosophy, I had to figure out some way to prove to grad schools that you should definitely let me do your CS program even though I don't have the degree. So I fully admit I got in, kind of involved in open source that way, but Python was because I just loved it. Um, but James's question then was, when the heck did I notice that Python started to become a thing? Uh, I would say it was roughly 2006. So I did, for instance, I did my master's degree at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, for those of you who know the school. Um, and I did that from 2003 to 2005. When I was there, people would ask what I did in my spare time. And one of the answers I would give is, oh, I contribute to Python. And half the answer, were, half the uh, responses to that was, what is that? Or is that that weird language where white space matters? <laughs> right? Like, that was, that was the level of exposure. And for some odd reason, around 2006, Python's popularity ticked up. And it ticked up like a Canadian reference, like a hockey stick. And it has not slowed down. And I don't know what it is. I don't know what flipped in people's brains. I, I think James has an idea. That was the year that numeric and numeray were merged to become NumPy. So James thinks it's because it's when NumPy came into existence. Um, there's just been a general growth overall. Um, but I would say, yeah, 2006, 2007 is about when it really started to take off and it stopped being like, what's that? And more just, oh, is that that language where white space matters? Or, you know, I don't use it because white space matters. And then eventually became, oh yeah, I, I use Python, I like it. And now we're here, we get to have people say, oh yeah, I came to Python because my employer made me come, not because I like Python, which is a whole nother level of popularity, right? When, <laughs> when people start to get forced to use your tool instead of because they love it, you've really hit the, the, the top, top tier of uh, importance. Uh, that, that little uh, nugget is, belongs to Jacob Kaplan Moss of Django, by the way. Next question. Yeah. No. Oh, no, go ahead. What happens if you take your tool out of the Python? Oh, if we were to delete everything I ever wrote for Python? Uh, you wouldn't have import anymore. Um, <laughs> for those who don't know, I implemented import lib. Uh, and then that got changed into the actual implementation of import behind the scenes. Uh, so technically, my code's making import work at this point. Uh, although Eric uh, helped a lot where we added Dunder specs uh, on the Dunder spec attribute uh, to stuff. So he also does credit at this point. Um, I don't know. Pep what, what's pep? Of tuple parameter on pep? Uh, okay, so James has uh, some uh, gri uh, gripe about one of the features I've removed of on Mac tuple unpacking in function signatures. It's PEP 3113 if you really want to read that one. Uh, I think I am the, am I the third? No, third or fourth most prolific PEP author at this point. That doesn't mean I have the most accepted PEPs, by the way, to be very clear. It's up there. I think I might be fourth behind Barry, Nick, and Guido. Um, I don't know, I, I've contributed a whole bunch of random things all, all over the place. Like my very first contr contribution actually was uh, the stir t pine, the stir p time function in the time module. Uh, so random thing over there. And then I, I wrote the dummy threading module, which is how the threading module used to work before we started to require threads. And I can't keep track anymore. 20 years, it's all over the place. It's just whatever, whatever struck my fancy at the time and what crazy project I decided to take on. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe you had a question. Yeah. So there was a great talk here yesterday about VS Code extensions. I was just curious, what are some of your favorites, even lesser known ones? Great. What are my favorite VS Code extensions uh, that are not the Python extension oh, or the various right. support <laughs> extensions that we uh, create? Uh, I don't know, honestly. Well, I don't pay attention. They're on all the time. I just have them installed and run everywhere. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's silly little ones like the Rainbow CSV extension that just color codes your CSV files and reformats the columns. I mean, it's stupid simple, but it's fantastic. Which one? Oh, uh, VS Code Pets is what my wife is telling me to say. Um, what else am I supposed to say, Peanut Gallery? Huh? 
Oh, Playwright integration, yeah. If you use Playwright to uh, do automated testing for your uh, websites and stuff, that's, that's a cool extension. Um, I don't know, I don't trick mine out very much. Like I have a bunch of extensions uh, for like Markdown from our teammate Matt to just have like the checkboxes work and render appropriately. And then I've got obviously the Python one and the Rust one and the C and C++ one. Uh, I, have all, I have all the GitHub ones, cause, partially because our team was in, because obviously all my work's on GitHub, so I have all those integrations. Um, what? Nicolas Cage? Nicolas Cage? <laughs> Oh, okay, there's an icon extension apparently that turns every icon into Nicolas Cage in some form. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I use the Mona Lisa font. Uh, if that's not an extension, but it is a cool, nice, nice little touch I have. Um, I'd use it. Uh, yeah, I could say that. so the Dev Container extension, but that's kind of part of the GitHub group. Um, yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I'd have to pull up VS Code and have a look. They just all kind of just work. But yes, my answer is the Python extension, according to my PM, Luciana, who's the PM for the Python extension. So she's not biased at all. Uh, hopefully that answers that. Uh, who else has a question? Yes. What's the, the most surprising thing that you learned as a member of the steering council about the language community or ecosystem that you didn't know before? What is the strangest thing I have learned from about the language community or anything else from being on the steering council? Jeez. Uh, honestly, I don't know. Not, so the funny thing about the steering council is there's nothing really going on there that isn't somehow, unless it's code of conduct, isn't being discussed publicly, right? Like, if you heard me during our, the little keynote section I did this morning, like, we, we, we make decisions based on consensus. So there really shouldn't be very much that gets to us that hasn't already been discussed publicly. And thus, hopefully, I've already seen it. So there's really not that much, although Eric seems to have a suggestion. So uh, Eric Snow, Foil Accord developer, and Carol Wayne, former steering council member, uh, both suggested the answer of how hard Guido's job happened to have been uh, when he was one person versus five. And yeah, I mean, it, we all knew it was a hard job, but it's, we, we learned some lessons from him. Luckily, Guido was on the first steering council to help kind of get us going and guide us along. Um, for instance, like, making decisions come from the steering council instead of from individuals to protect us from negativity from the community versus where Guido made the calls and it was directed at him personally, right? I mean, that was kind of a sad realization that kind of having an anonymized, almost an anonymized group of people in name that causes people not to be so grumpy uh, was a bit surprising, but in, in foresight probably shouldn't have been. Um, yes. Oh, yeah, the, the, my wife's pointing out um, the fun of trying to establish a governance model from scratch with zero input from Guido as much as he s stood back uh, and trying to make everyone agree. That was, quote unquote, a fun time in my life. Um, yeah, it was definitely challenging and a bit of an interesting experience trying to set up the governance model because for those of you who don't know, when Guido stepped down, he effectively left it up to all of us as core devs to decide how we wanted to govern ourselves and run ourselves. Uh, he, he, he would answer any questions we had, but he purposely tried to stay uh, back and not really get involved. He wanted us to choose how we wanted to run ourselves. And it was hard, right? I will not lie. It was really difficult. There were a lot of varying opinions. And we had to somehow all come to a consensus of how, what governance models were we going to consider, how were we going to vote on what those govern, uh, to choose a governance model, right? Even the voting was a huge undertaking just to choose what voting system to use, right? You can, you can go read all the, well, how many, no, we didn't do any peps in the end for the voting, did we? Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember. 
there was a lot of voting. Tim Peters, who wrote Tim Sort and the dictionary implementation, like Uncle Timmy, uh, if you may have heard in a couple talks today, like he wrote a bunch of simulations of what the voting could look like and how the outcomes would affect each other, right? Like I know way too much about voting systems now to ever be happy with first past the post. So uh, fun times for me in, in federal elections in Canada. Um, that was definitely, so that's one thing I definitely learned from being on the steering council is how voting systems work. Um, but yeah, I mean, otherwise, honestly, as I said, we try to govern on consensus. So there's nothing that really sneaks in that only the steering council sees, except for code of conduct. And that is stuff I was kind of aware of, because like I used to uh, help run the Python ideas mainly list with Titus Brown. And so I've dealt with conduct issues before. So that wasn't necessarily surprising that that existed. Um, I'm also on the conduct, uh, code of conduct working group for the PSF itself, so I'm still involved in that. Um, but yeah. Nothing too shocking, honestly. It's just more just, it's more about just making the decisions more than like, oh, I had no idea. Oh, yes. So, a bit of a self, it, uh, an itch to scratch, yeah. and it's putting you on the spot. It's That's right. In, uh, let's say Django, right? You write templates for HTML. Yes. And at the moment, we can't annotate to say that that's HTML or that it's JavaScript. And like Visual Studio has no way of saying, oh yeah, I know HTML, I can start like helping you with that. Um, would Python be um, amenable to actually annotating not the type, but the sub language somehow? So the question was, is Python amenable to annotating sub, annotating basically the type of content that a string holds, if I'm yeah, understanding like that question. A man type or something so like you that. need to track down Jim Baker yep. and ask him about the pep that he's writing. So there you go. So basically, Jim Baker, who uh, of Jython fame, uh, last year was talking with Guido, from my understanding, because uh, I was I attended virtually last year, um, about being able to add um, tagged strings and be able to customize what those tags are. And so that would allow you to say, like, this is a SQL statement, this is HTML, whatever, and then do whatever processing you need, because it would be able to tie back to a callable but also that would potentially lead, lead people to be able to understand that, oh, that is HTML or something. So talk to Jim Baker. One more question. One more question. Okay, James. You're about to step down from the steering council. Mm -hmm. What is your ideal for the person who replaces you? Is it someone with the same breadth of experience or does the steering council need newbies, people who are new to Python who have a brand new perspective? Oh, interesting. So James's question was, since I'm about to step down from the steering council, what do I hope of the person who's going to eventually replace me? <sighs> Honestly, as long as they continue to be open to inclusivity and the diversity that we encourage and welcome and love in this community, that's really all I care about, right? For me, it's all about the people. It's all about all of you, right? Like, I keep doing this because of you, and I'm not joking. Like, I come to PyCon to see James and to see Eric and to see Nicholas and to meet new people out here in the audience, right? Like, as long as we continue to engender a community of welcomeness and diversity and inclusion and just continue to make this an awesome place to be as a person, that's all I really care about at the end of the day. I could care less about the technology. I really don't care. We all have languages. It works. We could never change anything ever again and we'd be fine. I hope we keep fixing bugs, but honestly, we'd probably even be fine if we didn't do that. We'd learn how to work around them, but it's really the people I care about. So as long as the next person continues to care about the people, that's all I care about. <laughs>